If you were a doctor working in the NHS and felt strongly that some of the things going on around you are wasting money or even endangering people's lives, then you'd want to speak out, wouldn't you? Well, legal safeguards are supposedly in place to protect medics who blow the whistle on bad practice. But Inside Out has found an alarming number of professionals end up suspended and sat at home for months on end twiddling their thumbs at taxpayers' expense. Our reporter Mark Jordan investigates. When something goes wrong in the NHS, we should all care. Up to 1,300 deaths at Midstaff's Hospital. The case of serial killer Dr. Harold Shipman. And the tragedy of Baby P. All could have been prevented if staff in the NHS had felt free to speak out to bosses who would listen. But our investigation says that NHS staff who raise concerns are being hung out to dry. At a time of cutbacks and tight controls on NHS spending, Londoners are paying through the nose for doctors, dentists and other NHS staff to stay at home pruning roses. Not because they've done anything wrong themselves, but because they've blown the whistle on others. A small group of medics gather in London to discuss a problem which has changed their lives. All say they were wrongly suspended because they raised concerns at work about patient safety. I was invited to a meeting with HR who basically told me that I couldn't go back to my job. I was just told to go back to my office, clear my desk and, and get off the premises. They decided to um, bring this um, allegation against me and to really basically to get rid of me. In South London, an operation is underway, but the atmosphere of professionalism and care in this private hospital belies the pressure that the surgeon has been under in his other job, in urology and cancer care for the NHS. We'll actually operate through this actual metal tube. A little bit of swelling there, and then you can see there's the prostate there like a wall. Yeah. And we should... At Queen Elizabeth Hospital, surgeon Ramon Nakresh incurred the full wrath of bosses when he warned that closures to award and staff cuts would be disastrous for patients. So what was worrying you at Queen Elizabeth Hospital and your department there? I think what was worrying me basically was I didn't think the service we were delivering locally was, it was adequate, was safe. And so the concerns were related to staffing levels, uh, concerns about uh, outpatient clinic capacity, um, the number of clinical nurse specialists for cancer. There was a patient, for instance, who, because of outpatient, I guess, capacity, meant that uh, they had a biopsy uh, of their prostate. Uh, it was positive for cancer. However, they didn't come back for the first consultation to be told that they had cancer for six months. Ealing Hospital and Shamila Chowdhury was the manager in charge of 60 staff and the budget in radiology. She raised concerns about practices she claims were costing the trust thousands of pounds every month. Hello, how are you? All right. I was the um, imaging services manager. Um, my main role was to manage the department day in, day out. Um, so, and also I was the budget holder, so I was responsible for the budget. So you'd raise the issue of thousands of pounds of NHS money going astray? When I found irregularities, um, I was concerned because I wasn't quite sure if I had got it wrong. Um, but I did chase it up, I did bring it to attention of my line managers, senior managers within the trust. Shamilla's not alone. Across in North London, a senior doctor raised serious concerns about a hospital before it made headlines for all the wrong reasons with the death of baby P. Dr. Kim Holt was brought into St Anne's here in Haringey to sort out paediatrics. Now, you'd assume that since she'd been put in charge, she'd be allowed to raise concerns about the running of the unit. Under the GMC guidance, we have a professional duty to raise concerns where we feel that resources or systems impact upon patient care. And we'd been becoming increasingly worried about the fact that there were going to be cuts to that particular team. 
What each of our whistleblowers had in common was that having raised concerns with managers internally, they'd hoped the issues would be looked at. Instead, what happened was managers turned the tables on them. I was, uh, I guess, escorted uh, to a room, the chief executive's room. They basically said that a number of concerns had been raised, that uh, I was obviously to be suspended. They tried to use the health reason. They tried to say, oh, because you became unwell. They said they had a complaint made, a serious complaint made against me, and they actually marched me out of the premises. I was stunned, really, and humiliated. It's a bizarre feeling, because when you do end up leaving the hospital, uh, you feel rather empty, of course, and there isn't anyone you can turn to. Uh, it's not as if a crime has been committed and I can go to the police. Lawyers left to try and protect the shredded careers of whistleblowers claim there is a pattern. The focus, rather than being on the quality of the disclosure, becomes a focus on the character of the individual, the reputation of the individual, and then often becomes, how do we destroy that character? How do we destroy that reputation? According to the latest government figures for 2009-10, there were 29 new cases of suspensions of doctors and dentists in London, for all reasons such as sickness and misconduct. Under our Freedom of Information request, we can reveal there are further 55 doctors and dentists on long-term suspension from previous years. But we wanted to find out what the picture was for the rest of the London NHS. We send Freedom of Information requests to all 71 NHS hospitals in London, asking how many staff were suspended last year and what that cost the taxpayer. Out of 56 hospitals that responded, there were a total of 514 other NHS staff on suspension. Not all of them were whistleblowers, but add this to the doctors and dentists, and nearly 600 staff were suspended in the last financial year. Our Freedom of Information request further revealed that the cost last year in wages alone came to a staggering £3 million. That's enough to pay 175 nurses for a year. But that's just the tip of the iceberg. We've spoken to a number of clinicians who don't appear in the official figures because they've been assigned to so-called special projects. Numerous other suspended NHS whistleblowers spoke to us off the record. Put together, they confirmed that such gardening leave is costing the taxpayer millions. 15 month long suspension on full pay and I've just conducted eight hours of research work. I was suspended from work for more than five months on full pay doing nothing. This wasted more than £30,000 of NHS Three money. years in limbo being paid to do nothing. Dr Kim Holt didn't even figure in these statistics. For two years, the Trust paid her full salary to sit at home. It didn't make sense that they had somebody who could, do, who could work perfectly well in Haringey, sat at home on full pay for so long. There's something really wrong with our NHS if clinicians are not able to say things without fear of losing their jobs um, and being paid off using public money to keep quiet. Great Ormond Street told us... The Trust has organised workplace mediation with Dr Holt and her colleagues in Haringey. It is hoped that this will resolve any outstanding issues. Keeping quiet was something Henry Fernandez, a senior nurse from Kenton Medway, was determined not to do. Before Henry's tribunal for wrongful dismissal, he let it be known that he would never sign a gagging clause as he wanted his concerns about the death of a patient to be heard. Eventually, the trust settled without a gagging clause for £70,000. There was no way I was going to keep quiet about this. Even if I had to take out a page in the Times, a full page advert, and write my story down, that was what I was going to do. While Henry insists he was dismissed because he'd blown the whistle, the trust don't accept that. An out-of-court settlement was discussed with Henry Fernandez for unfair dismissal, but no agreement was reached. We do not consider the Public Disclosure Act to apply in this case, as Henry Fernandez was not an NHS whistleblower. Shamila Chowdhury is still fighting to be reinstated, despite winning an interim employment tribunal in June. Ealing Hospital told us... It's still an ongoing internal process. In relation to the judgment made at the interim hearing, we cannot comment further at this stage. Raman Nikresh won his case for protected disclosure and loss of reputation and is back at work after a successful campaign by colleagues. But the effort has left him with a whopping bill of £140,000 in legal fees. The South London NHS Trust told us... We believe the process of events which happened to Mr Nikresh would not happen now. 
and we're working with clinicians to get better reporting and processes in place. I think the perception obviously is that the uh, NHS is, uh, is a very open, transparent service and system where uh, individuals are obviously uh, perhaps uh, have, have the freedom to raise issues of concern. I think what's bizarre is that uh, it couldn't be further than the truth. Uh, well, this sounds like the Stasi of former Eastern Germany. Thank you.